Hello and welcome, everybody. It's time. It's 12 o'clock on a Wednesday. That means we should get started. It's the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Good to be with you, everybody, for today's program. My name is Chris Smith. I work for the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and I will be your host today and most Wednesdays. You can find me right here on our YouTube channel for the Lunchtime Discovery Series, which, by the way, is organized by the folks over at the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. Within the Department of Environmental Quality, they bring the fantastic speakers and get it all coordinated. And then we use our resources and expertise here at the museum in order to bring it to you live almost every single week. And, you know, we have a really good time. We meet interesting people. We learn interesting things. You all, the viewers, get the chance to ask your questions of all of the experts. Uh, and we have accrued a pretty good uh, like catalog of these talks. So pretty much anything about science or nature in North Carolina you want to learn about, you can scroll through the Lunchtime Discovery playlist here on our YouTube channel and find something interesting uh, from some really, really smart people who are really out there and engaged in doing good work. So uh, I'm glad you're all with us today because guess what? We're going to do it again. We've got somebody interesting who's going to talk about something very interesting. And in fact, uh, we're going to learn a little bit about some critters and a critter that I did not know much about until somewhat recently, even in my science and nature career, but has grown on me. And uh, I think I particularly came to like diamondback terrapins when I saw a baby one out on the coast. I was out uh, in like Carolina Beach area and happened to come across one on a trail. And now they might be my favorite turtle. Everybody, I want you to meet Elizabeth Penix. Elizabeth is the Southern Site Manager for the North Carolina Coastal Reserve and the National Estuarine Research Reserve and joins us now. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Glad you could be here. Uh, now, you've probably seen lots of baby diamondback terrapins, but I've only seen one. I have not seen a lot. They're pretty elusive. So they're not easy to find all the time, but when you do see them, yes, they kind of steal your heart. It was extremely cute. I took I took some pictures and then left it, went on my way, did not bring it home and keep right. it. Forever. I feel like I did a good. Well, uh, I'm interested to learn about uh, the work that you're doing. So I'll turn the program over to you. Wonderful. Thank you for that introduction. I'm going to. Oh, one second. And while you're doing that, I will remind everybody that as we go through the program, remember if you have questions, comments, experiences that you want to share, drop them into the chat on YouTube because I'm going to be looking to all of you for the questions when we get through the presentation. So we're gonna do the slideshow, and then I want to know what you're thinking about and what questions you have. Uh, and in particular, your experiences out on the coast. Like, has anybody else seen a Diamondback Terrapin? Am I the only one? Am I special? I don't think so. I think so. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I hope people have seen them. <laughs> Okay, are you seeing my screen, Chris? Looks good. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you guys for having me. Um, like Chris said, my name is Elizabeth Penix. Um, I work with the North Carolina Coastal Reserve and National Estuarine Research Reserve, which is a very large mouthful of names. Um, <laughs> I'm here today to talk about diamondback terrapin. Um, but, but just before I jump into our topic for today, I wanted to say thank you to DEQ Department of Education and Public Affairs, um, as well as the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science, just for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to provide a little bit of background about our program first, and then we'll jump right into talking about terrapins. So you are looking at a beautiful shot of the Masonboro Island Reserve. So this site is actually located in Wilmington, North Carolina. So I am housed in Wilmington. So I'm actually not in Raleigh, I'm in Wilmington. Um, 
I work for the North Carolina Coastal Reserve. So what this is, is a network of 10 sites across the coast of North Carolina. So this program is part of a larger network of national sites that I'll talk about more later in the presentation. Um, our program is housed under the Department of Environmental Quality, as well as within the Division of Coastal Management. Um, the program is funded through a federal state partnership between DEQ and NOAA, so the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, and is comprised of four national sites. So you'll see those in red on the map. So we have Zeke's Island, Masonboro Island, Rachel Carson, and Currituck Banks. Um, these are part of our national program. And then we also have these purple sites um, on the map. And these are the six state sites. Basically, the only difference in these is we manage them all the same, but these National sites have research programs that contribute to that larger national network that I'll talk about um, in a second. So the mission of the reserve is basically to practice and promote informed management and appreciation of North Carolina coastal and estuarine ecosystems. Um, so we provide these uninhabited natural ecosystems as living laboratories. We can use them for research, for education, and as well as stewardship of the actual natural resource itself and the species that exist there. Um, all 10 of our sites are open to the public all year round. Um, so you can go to them, visit them. I highly encourage you to go check them out. Um, they're all different and all beautiful in their own way. So if you get a chance to check them out, I definitely, definitely recommend it. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about our program, this is going to be our plan for today. So we're going to go over the introduction to diamondback terrapins, their biology, their habitat, where you might find them, and any threats that they have. Then we're going to talk about why terrapins. Why do they matter? Other than just being a very cute turtle, why do they matter? Then we'll talk about some of the research and protections that... Um, researchers and conservationists are working on to protect the species. We'll talk about the current status and then how you can get involved and what you can do to help. So first, our lovely little elusive marsh turtle. So hopefully you've been able to see one of these in the wild. Um, if you haven't, there are a few aquariums on our coast that do have some diamondback terrapins if you want to see one. Um, they are a relatively small species of turtle. And what's cool about the diamondback terrapin is they live their entire life cycle exclusively in the estuary. So estuaries are where salt and freshwater mix. So think of where a river and the ocean meet in an inlet. It creates this brackish water because the freshwater and the salt water are mixing to create this brackish um, salinity water. So where diamondback terrapins live is that fringing habitat along our coast where we have brackish water. They are found along the coast all the way from Cape Cod all the way down to Texas um, in the Gulf Coast. And as you can see in these photos, there's different variations in appearance. So not one is the same, which makes them extremely unique and a charismatic species. Um, you One easy way to tell it's a terrapin is based on its coloration. So some will have these really light colors. Um, you'll see in this one, very white with bright speckles on it. Some have really dark uh, markings on their face, which look like mustaches, which are really adorable. Um, but one really cool thing about the diamondback terrapin is on their shell, which is also called their carapace, um, they have these concentric rings on their shells, which is where they get their name from. So diamondback terrapin. So you can kind of look at some of these and see the diamond shaped, the circles on their shells. The picture in the bottom left corner is a really um, cool picture to show a special thing about terrapins. 
they are sexually dimorphic. And what this means is that the males are much smaller than the females. So females will get much larger. Um, so that in that picture, the females on the bottom and the male is on the top. Um, they're the ones that carry the eggs. They're much larger. They have to be able to dig nests on the beach in order to lay their eggs. Um, so that's kind of just a cool piece. And that will kind of come into play later on in the talk as well. So maybe you've seen one, maybe you think you've seen one. What, what is the difference? Okay, so I get this question all the time. What's the difference in a turtle and a sea turtle and a terrapin? Well, they have a lot in common, actually. So they all breathe air. Um, they are reptiles. They need to lay eggs, um, and they do this on land. So they do not lay their eggs in the water. They'll actually come out of the marsh and these estuaries and lay their eggs in the sandy habitat on islands, um, in people's front yards, backyards of their houses, along waterways. Um, they need that sand to sandy habitat to kind of lay their eggs, just like a sea turtle would. Um, they also all of these species have shells. So they have a hard shell to protect them. But what they have in that's different is that diamondback terrapins and sea turtles, they have a shell, but they are not able to pull their appendages in to protect themselves. So if you've seen a box turtle, maybe in your backyard, um, they're more terrestrial. So they're gonna be land dwellers. They go in water, but they don't live the primary part of their life in water. They can box up. So they actually put all of their appendages in together and they can hide from predators inside their shell. Um, and another big difference between these species is their habitat. Obviously, you're not going to find a tortoise in the marsh. <laughs> and if you do, you need to call someone. <laughs> um, so box turtles are going to be more terrestrial freshwater. Sea turtles, they live the majority of their life, primarily all of their life, in the ocean. Salt water, um, you may see them in the sounds, but they live in the ocean. And terrapins, like I said earlier, are just in that small little area where the fresh and the salt water mix. So the sounds, the backside of barrier islands, and they're relatively small. A sea turtle can weigh up to 300 pounds. So we're not dealing with that. We're talking like a dinner plate size for um, a terrapin. So the video down at the bottom just shows you how they get around in the water. They have pretty long, they have well versatile and they are able to get through the marsh. They have claws and they can kind of move through the marsh grass. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about terrapins and how to identify them, where do they live? What kind of habitat do they like? So I mentioned earlier that they're from, they're found all the way from Cape Cod down to Texas in the Gulf Coast. Um, what is really interesting is that there are different subspecies of diamondback terrapins. And in North Carolina, we have two of those subspecies. So you'll see on the map, there's a difference of color between the red and the blue. Um, this differentiates the northern subspecies versus the Carolina subspecies. Um, it's around where Cape Hatteras National Seashore is, is where kind of that break line is. And the reason that we have all these different subspecies is dates back to the history of the terrapin. And there was a lot of trade, um, farming, and intermixing of the different uh, species. So over time, they've kind of created these different areas where these turtles are now living. They all look very similar. So the only way you'd be able to tell a subspecies is by doing a DNA analysis. So for the, for the purpose of this talk, they're all diamondback terrapins. Um, so you can see in this video, they're very well suited for their habitat. They're extremely strong swimmers and they can navigate through thick marsh grass. Um, they also can walk pretty well on land, as you can see, um, kind of getting through all that marsh muck. Um, if you've ever been stuck in the marsh, you understand how hard that is to get out of it. Uh, another cool fact about terrapins is they can hold their breath 
up to 45 minutes. And like other turtles, they need heat. So they need the sun, they need warm water to basically keep them going. So what happens in the winter is they don't leave. So they don't migrate, they stay in their home range. What they do is they'll actually brumate, which is similar to hibernation, and they will hunker down in the marsh mud and kind of bury themselves and they will hang out all winter until the water warms up and then they'll come out in the springtime. So the spring is when they start breeding and laying their nests. Um, so they'll actually stay down in the marsh creeks, hiding in the marsh until the water starts to warm up and they can start moving around again. So they're very well suited. They're very adaptable. Um, they do prefer that brackish water, but they have been found in both complete salt water as well as complete fresh water. So they're a really resilient, um, really amazing, cool little turtle. So historically, there's been a long, a long history with diamondback terrapin in North Carolina. Um, they were once considered a delicacy um, in dishes such as turtle soup. They also were documented in American Indian ritualistic practices. So they had a really large value. People wanted them. Um, they ate them. Nowadays, that is not the case. Um, when people had such a high want for these, um, the commercial selling and farming really started picking up. Um, that documents back in North Carolina all the way before the Civil War. So this is not a new thing for the state of North Carolina. Um, diamondback terrapins in North Carolina were once so abundant, they were actually considered a nuisance species to a lot of fishermen um, because instead of catching their targeted species, they were actually pulling in tons of ter diamondback terrapins. So by the early 1900s, Terrapins were in such high demand for soup um, that farms for breeding were actually established in the state. Um, there were actually a few up near Moorhead City, if you're familiar with that area. Um, so they were actually breeding, capturing terrapins out of the wild and breeding them in order to have them for sale. So as the farming and the over-harvesting continued, the wild stock obviously quickly diminished. Um, this kind of put an end to the desire for turtle soup. Um, and nowadays, they are listed as a state species of special concern. So this is not a threatened or endangered listed species. This is just special concern, which means that we need to have more information on it in order to make a better um, decision about its population abundance. Um, we also, in the state, since it does have that designation, it, you must be permitted in order to have possession or collection of this species. So you cannot have a diamondback terrapin as a pet. <laughs> um, so, and also along the entire East Coast, um, every state at this point now has protection in order to um, conserve and protect the diamondback terrapin, which is really great for the species along the whole East Coast. So now that you know a little bit more about diamondback terrapins, you're, you're, you really like them, you think they're cool, but how do we better protect them? What are their threats? Um, one major threat that we deal with is the commercial crabbing industry. Um, if you're familiar, most of the time, the crabbing, in order to catch blue crabs, you deploy crab pots. So in that first picture on your left, you'll see a crab pot that had an incidental capture of diamondback terrapins, many, many, many diamondback terrapins. Um, how those pots work is there's a funnel on each side, and the goal is for the blue crabs to come into the pot go after the bait, and then once they get in, they get stuck. Um, and so then the fishermen will come and pull up the pots, 
and then harvest their blue crabs. But the issue is that diamondback terrapins are also similar size and they will go into the pots as well. Well, they breathe air. So when these pots are submerged underwater, they actually get in, they're unable to escape, and then they end up drowning in these pots. Um, it's also pretty well known that once one terrapin goes in, others will follow it. Um, so that's why you'll get multiples in one crab pot. So the goal is obviously not to catch these terrapins, they're incidental captures. But that's something that we deal with on our coast, um, as well as up and down the East Coast. Another threat they face are habitat loss um, between coastal development, um, as well as increased storms, sea level rise. Picture basically squeezing their habitat. So you saw it's that small fringe of habitat that they live in. Um, we're kind of squeezing it, making it smaller and smaller, and they have to find area that's suitable for them to live, to forage, um, and to lay their eggs on habitat um, that's suitable that will incubate their eggs. Um, so habitat loss is a big one for diamondback terrapins, as well as human and predator interactions. There are many places along the East Coast um, that have highways or roadways that now cut through some of this really decent habitat for terrapins, and they are now having to cross roads in order to get to nesting habitat. Um, so they run into car strikes, um, boat strikes when they're in the waterways. Um, since they do breathe air, they'll pop up to the surface. Um, when they do, sometimes they're sadly encountered by a boat. Um, and then lastly is nest predation. So like sea turtles, they lay their eggs right in the sand and leave them. Um, they cover them up, but they're really only a few inches down under the sand. So mammals, predators like possum, raccoon, coyote, foxes, um, they can smell them and get to them and actually eat the eggs. So that's also another um, big threat to actually increasing the population. So they're small and they've got a lot of things against them, but they are mighty. I will tell you that. Um, they are just a wonderful species to study. Um, so we know everything about them, but why, why do we care? What, why is the diamondback terrapin a big deal? Um, they are actually a keystone species um, for marsh ecosystems. So what this means is that with the decline of this one species, other things are going to be impacted. So the diet of the diamondback terrapin is primarily composed of periwinkle snails. So they have these strong jaws where they can bite in and crunch things. So they like crabs, they like snails. Um, so you'll see in this picture is um, periwinkle snails. So if you've ever walked around in the marsh, you've probably had one fall in your boot and it broke off from the marsh grass. Um, these little snails will climb up on the marsh grasses and they actually eat away at the marsh grass. Well, terrapins love to eat the snails. So if we lose our terrapins, we don't have anything managing that population of snails. And the snails will actually end up overgrazing on our marsh grass, which will deplete our marsh habitat. So the root system is what holds our marshes together of all these grasses. And so if we have a lack of grass, a lack of root system, we're going to have increased erosion. The sediment will go away. Um, and that just leads to a whole slew of issues. There's lack of habitat for other species. Um, and one really big thing for us humans is marshes are our main line of defense against storms and they filter water and they protect us. Um, so it's just a really important system that we make sure that we keep our diamondback terrapins so that they can, you know, preserve the marsh one periwinkle snail at a time. Okay, so now you. Remember I was mentioning this national program. 
So now we know where terrapins are. They're all along the East Coast. And this is where our program really comes in to make a difference. So this is the National Estuarine Research Reserve. So you see us in North Carolina. So we have those 10 sites along the coast, you'll remember. Um, this national program is nationwide and we have sites. There's 30 sites along um, the country and we're growing still. So you'll see some gaps and we're all working together to acquire some more sites. Um, 18 of those sites have suitable terrapin habitat. So it's really important that we focus on protecting these habitats, researching these sites and understanding the habitats that these, these little turtles live in as well as other species. Um, and just in our little corner of the country, there's 81% of coastal wetlands located. Um, so just from North Carolina down to Florida, has 81% of the coastal wetlands. So this just goes to show you how important it really is to work to protect our coastal areas. And then unfortunately, more than 80,000 acres of coastal wetlands are lost on average each year. And this does include freshwater wetlands as well. Um, but this just goes to show you how important this system is and how we make an effort and really try to protect not just the diamondback terrapin, but all of our coastal ecosystems. So one of the main primary purposes of the research reserve is, you guessed it, research. Um, we spend a lot of our time trying to understand our sites and understand what's going on, how they're changing, so that we can plan for the future. One example of research that's going on with diamondback terrapins currently is bycatch reduction devices. So these are called BRDs for short. Um, and there's some really great researchers and labs at UNC Wilmington, um, specifically out of Dr. Amanda Williard's lab. Um, I put a QR code on the screen if you want to learn more about her and her research. Um, they're doing really amazing things for diamondback terrapins in our area. But what they're looking at with BRDs is they're working with the blue, cra the blue crab fishery and actually working together to create these small devices that are installed on crab pots that will exclude terrapins. So the terrapins won't be able to get into the crab pot, but the blue crabs will still be able to get in. Um, so we're working together to, you know, make it the best situation for everyone. Um, we want them to be able to continue their livelihood and get blue crabs. And then we also want to protect those time back there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, the second way that we do research is the Terrapin Tally. So maybe you've heard about this. This is a community science project. Um, so basically, the North Carolina Coastal Reserve, as well as the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, teamed up to create this project to better understand diamondback terrapin populations in North Carolina. So it was a small project started in 2014 to basically train volunteers to go out in the marsh, kayak, and document how many terrapins they see. Um, well, it really took off. And so now we've expanded. Um, we have 11 different sites that you can participate at. Um, there's a map on a, at a future slide that you'll be able to look to see where you can participate. Um, but it's a great way of including the community as well as the science in order to get a task accomplished. Um, we can't be everywhere at once, so it's really helpful to have these surveys and this data collected in order to understand where crab pots are um, in our marsh systems as well as document terrapin sighting. So the last research um, topic I'm gonna touch on is just population abundance. So this also comes out of Dr. Williard's lab. 
you'll see in the picture, we're actually installing a radio telemetry tag onto the shell of this Diamondback Terrapin. And it does not hurt them. It actually falls off eventually because their shells shed. So like a snake would molt or um, shed its skin, terrapins do the same thing. They'll actually lose some of their um, scoops on the top of their shell. So it just pops right off. So we would put this on there and we were able to go out in the marsh and track the movement of these terrapins. So they have extremely small home ranges. So we're trying to understand how small and we're thinking that they're actually larger than we used to think. Um, so they don't migrate. Like I said, they kind of stay in the same little habitat. But this has really helped us to understand their movement, their patterns, as well as the habitat they prefer. Because if we can identify where they really prefer to be, we can help protect that area. Okay, so conservation efforts that we are working on both with different agencies as well as through the Coastal Reserve. Um, all of that research that has been going on has helped to better understand the populations of diamondback terrapins in North Carolina, as well as other projects that are happening in other states. So like I said, the Terrapin Tally, the community science project, um, has directly contributed to data that helped identify the first pilot project, which is a diamondback terrapin management area. So all of that data collection started in 2014 and all of that compiled up until a decision in 2020 um, that actually implemented these diamondback terrapin management areas. So the public and researchers helped to contribute to this. And that map on the left-hand side actually shows you where these two pilot projects are. So two of which are part of our national sites with the Coastal Reserve, Masonboro Island and Zeke's Island. And then we also have area down at Baldhead State Natural Area. Um, just so you're familiar with the area, this is the Cape Fear River that comes down the middle. And Wrightsville Beach is just north of Masonboro Island. Um, and Carolina Beach is down here. So just so you get an idea of where we're talking. Um, so these diamondback terrapin management areas, they were identified based on the data that we provided, as well as the crab pot fishery interactions. So how many people are reporting that terrapins are being found in crab pots? So like I said, in 2020, this management plan was put forth by the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, and what it requires is that commercial fishing pots in both of those areas now have to have an excluder device. So those BRDs I was talking about um, or a modified funnel size. So you'll see in the picture here, this is a crab pot that would be completely submerged under the water in the marsh. So this is a BRD. So this is a bycatch reduction device. And how it works is the terrapin their shell sticks up so high that they would be unable to make it through, whereas the crabs would just slide right in. So those are now required to be on commercial pots in both of these areas, which is a huge success. Um, just being able to get that through was a very big deal. Um, but as always with a new policy, new rules, we're in a learning phase. Um, so many researchers, many commercial users are working to find the best solutions um, to move forward with this because we obviously, we love blue crabs, but we love diamondback terrapin. So we're trying to work together to kind of find the best options and solutions for the crab pot fishery. Um, other efforts that are taking place along the coast are the yearly ghost pot cleanup. Um, this is including multiple state agencies, nonprofits, as well as the community. And they set out to identify abandoned crab pots that are left in the marsh. Um, and the, this is typically outside of the fishing, 
illegal crab pot fishing time. So if they're left in the marsh, they're typically abandoned at this point. Um, so we report them and then they are removed from the marsh. So you'll see this picture um, on the right hand side of an abandoned pot that's sitting in the marsh that can be really detrimental to um, really anything that decides to go in there because they're not being tended to. So those pots are not being checked. Um, so anything that gets in is likely going to be stuck in there. Um, we also are working to just educate. Education, awareness, outreach, it's really helping bring some attention to this small little turtle. Um, and education is a big part of our program as well. So encouraging the next generation to learn more, to be interested um, is really important for the success of the species. Um, one last thing to note is just we're working um, within the reserve as well as with partners um, to help identify nesting habitat. Um, that's kind of a missing piece that we're unable to figure out where they're nesting, how many nests are we having on these protected sites um, so that we can protect them. Um, we can use different um, equipment to basically protect those nests, just like you do a sea turtle nest. Um, and like Chris said, they are very small when they hatch. So that picture in the bottom right corner is a hatchling diamondback terrapin. Um, so they are about the size of a quarter. They, they live a tough life, but they, they make it. So, um, that's kind of our next, our next venture is trying to figure out and identify the habitats that they're using primarily to nest. Okay, so now what? You've learned a lot, but what can you do? So like I said, the status of the terrapin is a species of special concern. And what that means is we need more data. So any sighting reports that you have, any volunteering that you can contribute to any of these programs is extremely helpful. If you do want to participate in the Diamondback Terrapin Terrapin Tally, um, I have a map up here with a QR code. This goes directly to our Terrapin Tally website. And you can look at past year's information. This event does happen in the spring. So check back in early spring to get dates. And we'll have training sessions. And you can learn more about it. Um, but these are all the locations that there are routes available to participate at. So it ranges all the way from Cape Lookout National Seashore all the way down to the South Carolina border in Sunset Beach. So if you do want to learn more about the Terrapin Tally or if you want to report a sighting or if you have a question, um, please feel free to direct them to the email address on the slide. Um, this is for the Wildlife Resources Commission email. So you can feel free to reach out to them, volunteer. Um, and get out there, go to, go to the sites, experience them, teach someone else something you've learned today. Um, really word of mouth and learning and educating is how we get a lot done um, together. So our plans moving forward are to continue the Terrapin Tally efforts and expand. We want to move to different sites as well as outside of our state. Um, ideally, we'd have this running on the whole East Coast to get a better picture of what's going on. Identify habitat preferences, increase awareness, and then always, always continue our research and figure out what's going on. And the last thing I'll touch on is just this graph. Um, this is from the Terrapin Tally um, since 2014, so up to 2023. We skipped 2020 because of COVID, unfortunately. So we don't have consistent. We missed that year. Um, but starting in 2021 was when we had our expansion. So from 14 to 19, we only conducted this project at Masonboro Island. So the numbers are relatively low compared to what they are in 21, 22, and 23. But that's because we had more sites. So Looking at 21 to now, numbers are dropping. There are a lot of factors that play into this. Weather, 
uh, water temperature? Have they started moving around yet? Are they still hiding out? So there's a lot of different factors, but the more exciting information we can have to understand the species is just going to help us in the future. Um, and anyone that wants to participate, we appreciate any contribution in volunteering. <laughs> So with that, I just want to say thank you um, to the DQ education team as well as the museum. Um, so like I said, I work for the North Carolina Coastal Reserve and National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, my email is on the screen. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, I am located in Wilmington, um, so we are on the coast. But please follow us on social media. We have um, ways that learn more and test your knowledge about the reserve, um, get to see live photos of our different sites. Um, and if you want to learn more about um, other topics and research education, our QR code to our website is down in the bottom corner. So thank you. Elizabeth, thank you. Fantastic presentation. Great. I'm glad. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> It, I mean, just to see all of the the great photos of Diamondback Terrapins, too. Uh, just, they're such beautiful turtles. They oh, are. They're so pretty. skin and the diamond shell. It's awesome. They are, they are beautiful turtle. When you see them in real life, it is just, they're, they're quite striking. And when you see them in the water, you'll only see their little head pop up. So... I mean, for reference, maybe a few inches, um, you'll just see water and then this cute little white speckled head pop out of the water. Um, they're pretty, you don't see them all the time, but when you do, it's really exciting. I love it. I love it. Uh, so viewers, let me remind you, you can ask your questions. A few questions have already come into the chat and I'm going to be looking there uh, real soon. Uh for all of your questions. So go ahead, get them typed up, posted in there. Uh, Elizabeth, I'm a little curious if you can share with us about your work as the Southern Site Manager and how Terrapins factor into the work that you do for the Coastal Reserve and the Estuarine Reserve System. Yeah. So Terrapin work is a very small percentage of my time. Um, as the Southern Sites Manager, I manage for reserve properties out of our Wilmington office. Um, so these are maybe anyone's been to them. It's Masonboro Island, Zeke Island, Baldhead Woods, and Bird Island Reserve. Um, so as the site manager, I manage everything about the sites. So the natural resources, the species, visitation, signage, trails, um, all of that. We are, we are on the ground doing. Um, so terrapins are just a small piece and a favorite piece of my job that I get to do um, to help, you know, contribute to the research. So we help to facilitate researchers getting out there, understanding where the habitat is that they would be. Um, we also help to provide internships um, for our students to get out there and study this species, as well as sea turtles and other um, topics of interest. But yeah, so it's a lot of it's a lot of different things. There's never a dull moment. Yeah, that, that was that was a lot of hats to wear. Yeah, <laughs> for taking care of these natural places. Yeah, I'm never bored. Yeah, I can, I can certainly imagine. You know, I, I'm curious because when I think of North Carolina's coast, the first thing that comes to mind for me and maybe a lot of other people uh, is visiting the coast. I think about going as a tourist, being a tourist, or going to spend a day or a weekend at the beaches, uh, maybe going to see the aquariums or something like that. And uh, maybe for those of the people who tune into the Lunchtime Discovery Series, also taking in some of the natural areas because there are great parks and, you know, like the, the reserves that you help manage. Uh, do you feel like or do you know what some of the misconceptions might be about diamondback terrapins or something or things that people just don't get about them that maybe puts them in this special concern status? 
Uh, one big thing is that if you don't see them, they're not there. Mm. Um, they are there. Uh, we see signs of them all the time. Um, they do come out on the beach. Um, I, I think they're just out there having a good time on the beach. Um, but they'll actually walk around and bask in the sun. Um, especially the females that are looking for suitable nesting habitat when it's time. Um, we'll see tracks on the sand of them. Um, but a lot of people have thought that they're not, you know, that they're not there, but they are, they're just extremely secretive and elusive. Um, so that would be one thing. And I would say, just keep your eyes open like you did just always be on the lookout for them. Um, there's never, you're always going to find something new when you go to a natural area. I, I've worked here for six years and every time I go out there, I find something new. Um, so just awareness and, you know, getting out there and you're out there enough. You'll see one. Excellent stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me get to some questions from the chat. Uh, some good ones came in. Like Glenn was curious about the origin of the name terrapin. Why we call these terrapins and not just turtles or tortoises or. I have no idea. Know. I actually do not know. <laughs> I think because they just want to be special. We'll say that. <laughs> makes them makes them special. All right, next one for you. Amanda wants to know, when is the annual ghost pot cleanup? And is there an organization you might recommend so that individuals can get involved? Yeah, so it's during the winter. Um, so this fishery is closed during a window of time during the winter um, that we're able to go out. So this, this will be advertised. Um, I would say the main organization on the coast that we work with to actually conduct these um, cleanups are the Division of Marine Fisheries, as well as the North Carolina Coastal Federation. Um, so they kind of spearhead that project, get out there, clean up the coasts, um, and then they also take um, coordinates. So like I'll, I'll send volunteers out and they take pictures and locations of where these pots are we send them to that agency and then they go out and retrieve them um, because it is illegal to remove a active fishing crab pot. Um, so do not remove them. You can just send locations, um, ideally coordinates, and then a picture of where you are. And that can be passed along to the Division of Marine Fisheries as well as the Coastal Federation. Let some experts take care of it. Yes. Yeah. You do your part and then the experts can jump in. Exactly. And they're large and heavy sometimes. So it's not really easy to throw onto a kayak or where whatever you're on. Oh, okay. No, see, I wouldn't have I didn't realize that. I mean, I guess I knew they would have been a, a good size for catching crabs, but they're I mean, they're fairly large um mm -hmm. and they vary in size, but most of the ones that are left or lost and it's not because they leave them sometimes they're a storm comes in and they get pushed away from where we think they are or fall off a dock or um, there's a lot of different reasons um but sometimes they'll get so buried in the mud that they're heavy or they have barnacles on them so they're not they're not fun to deal with so definitely if you're going to touch them have gloves on or just report them Will wants to know, why is there only one species of brackish turtle? How did the diamondback terrapins curb the market on salt marsh habitat? I don't, they're just that resilient. Um, they have just adapted over time. Um, and they still to this day are adapting. Um, there are those different subspecies that I talked about. So they can vary a little bit. Um, but for the most part, yeah, that's the only species and they're just holding it down. They're just, they're just there. <laughs> they, they, they got a good spot. Yeah. Not letting anybody else have it. Mm -hmm. There's lots of snails. Yes. Yes. A lot. Um, yeah. If you spend any time walking around in the marsh, 
you're going to have snails in your boots. Um, they are just, they're pretty abundant. Um, and they can, they definitely can overgraze a marsh system. So it's really, really, you can actually hear them sometimes, the terrapins in the marsh, like cracking, like crunching on snails. Um, yeah, it's like, it's their favorite food. So. So, so when you visit a marsh, they go out, go out to Fort Fisher, you walk out yeah. on the boardwalk. Just put your ear to the marsh and just listen for crunching. Yep. See if you can see. <laughs> it'll be, it'll either be crabs pitching or mm -hmm. a diamondback terrapin, you know, eating breakfast. <laughs> that, I love everything about that. Yeah. All right. Uh, so Will's got another great question here. And one that I was thinking about too, as sea levels rise, should we expect to see them expand their range up rivers that lead into the sounds? Or do we think that the terrapins are just going to be in trouble? That is a wonderful question. And it's happening. So right. exactly what you think is already happening. Um, specifically, I mean, my, my area is, you know, Wilmington. So specifically in the Cape Fear River, um, there are now creek systems further and further up the river that we are now having sightings of turtles. And we're having to figure out, are you talking terrapins, sea turtle? And it's both. Um, we are having sea turtles move up the river. We're having terrapins move up the river um, because of increased salinity. Our water's moving more um, into these areas. So they are able to expand their range, which is a huge thing that we're having to look at because originally we thought they hung out in these one little marsh areas like if they if they were there that's where they stayed and now we're seeing that's not the case they're actually moving a lot more um than we anticipated so yes that that is absolutely happening is they're moving up the river to find habitat um there's more opportunity because the water is more salty um moving up so yep they're I, like i said they're a resilient creature they're just gonna go until they find what they want yeah you know on in the in this program we've heard from researchers with um uh, i think they're now the duke university school of the environment um who study the ghost forests saltwater intrusion oh, up yeah. into the formerly freshwater areas uh that sort of that wipe out the forests that are there these wetland forested areas it would concern me that you know, the, the terrapins are best adapted for finding like snails and crabs that moving upwards, like following the salinity and following the temperature changes is one good adaptation. But then getting into these areas that don't necessarily have grassland yep. uh, wetland environments mm -hmm. like what are found on the on the sounds and uh, uh, the, no, that's, right that's on the coast too, like. That's a great point. And that's exactly what I was referring to is we have this gotcha. moving of salt water up the river um, from many different reasons, sea level rise, dredging, um, all these things creating more water moving up. Um, and honestly, they are, they're going to move up and they're not going to have their normal diet. Um, if they can't find it. So they're going to find other things, which could be a, you know, a source for another species that only eats that. So it's just, it's just kind of compounds on itself. Um, and yeah, yeah, there's no telling what's going to happen, but we're, we're trying to figure it out, <laughs> keeping an eye on it. I mean, yeah, I'm glad there's people working on it. Uh, the last thing that, that I'm curious about is what you think of the, the pace of coastal development and the pace of uh, education that's uh, that people are receiving, um, the pace of we like we know that coastal development is happening. We also know that you know I feel like there's lots of news all the time about uh, how coastal development on North Carolina's coast leads to things like beach erosion, 
uh, and and other issues. I would say a lot of people these days seem to be pretty familiar with these issues. Like we've seen, you know, after hurricanes come through and then we see abandoned beach houses collapsing in the oceans, for example. And people know those stories. But how that impacts people's perceptions of the natural world and their place in it and our place in it alongside these species. Since you're since you're there in Wilmington, you're interacting yeah. with people who are visiting these sites uh, and seeing this for yourself. Yeah. So my my personal opinion is that it's going to always happen. I mean, we're we're going to have coastal development. It. I, I live on the coast. Yeah. I want to be here. Um, so it's something that we have to deal with. Um, it's going to always be there. Um. It's going to be something that we are going to work with, but I have seen such a flip in perspective um, from communities, from you know state organizations, from our own agency, where the focus is resiliency. We're trying to figure out how we can work with the things that are already happening and make them better and keep them here for the future. Um, there, it's going to be tough and we have a big fight ahead of us, you know, it's good, but it's all, we're all in it together. And I have seen a big shift in just communities being more interested in getting out in nature and appreciating nature. Um, we were talking earlier, just COVID really turned a switch on with people that want to be out in nature and experience it and appreciate it. Um, and the education that we provide through the reserve, as well as, you know, the whole department, um, as well as other states is just, it's making a difference, I, I think. Um, I think it's really impacting others and creating this new kind of, you know, excitement for things to come in the future. Um, I, I, I stay positive. I, I, <laughs> sometimes it's hard, but um, I do, I do feel like we're making a difference and that good things will come of this. I like it. That sounds great. That was a fantastic answer. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, that was wonderful to hear. Excellent stuff. Uh, Elizabeth, thanks for being on the program today. This was lovely. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Everybody, you can tune in again next Wednesday at noon with us right here at the museum's YouTube channel. Uh, if you look over there on the chat on YouTube, the Office of Environmental Education, North Carolina OEEPA as the user, they've dropped a bunch of links where you can get information for next week's presentation. We're going to move a little bit west of the coast and talk about the wildlife around Lake Waccamaw. Don't miss it. It's going to be fun and exciting. We're going to meet some cool critters. We're going to hear from interesting people once again. So uh, information about that is over there in the chat. You can click through. You can also check out the social medias where the museum and the Office of Environmental Ed Education are both active. And we all have websites. We're an easy web search away. Naturalsciences.org is us. EENorthCarolina.org is the DEQ Office of Environmental Education. All the links, everywhere you look, we're going to be out there bringing you great stuff all the time. So I hope that we will see you again here soon on this program. Everybody, big round of applause one more time for Elizabeth. Thank you so much for being here. And everybody, uh, take care, stay safe, be kind. We'll see you again next week. Bye.